Blog Talk Radio. Archangels, ghosts, and Bigfoot, oh my, it's just another night for Supernatural Girls. Real stories, real answers to life's biggest supernatural mysteries. And now, for another exciting interview with paranormal experts from this world and others, here's your host, paranormal researcher Patricia Baker, on the one, the only, Supernatural Girl. Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker, and again, I'm here by myself because PK, our lovely Patricia Kirkman, is still sick. I guess this thing is going around, and it is really, really tough to get rid of. So she is at home, she is coughing, and she is unable to join us tonight and share any of her numerology wisdom. But she'll be back next week, and I hope by then she is completely 100% herself. So tonight we've got a great guest and an incredible story that he is going to tell us all about. We have Paul Blake Smith, and he is the author of Three Presidents, Two Accidents, and... M041, the bombshell before Roswell. Now, I didn't know this. Maybe you didn't know this as well, but there was a crash before Roswell, and there were bodies. And we're going to hear all about what happened from Paul Blake Smith in just a few minutes. But first of all, you must go to our Facebook page and take a look at a video that showed up on YouTube, and it was only identified as 123. And it was a video that was posted that shows a huge space station-type UFO flying behind the moon. It is there. I tracked the video down. I posted it on our Facebook page. So please, you guys, go take a look and tell me what you think. It is it, it's really incredible. I mean, it's they can't get away with hiding much from us anymore. They certainly weren't able to hide this. And somebody posted it fairly anonymously with that title, 123, but guess what? We found it anyways. So take a look at our Facebook page for that. And also, a very sad story, unfortunately, North Korea is now executing psychics. So apparently people in North Korea turn to psychics and spiritual advisors because obviously they don't trust their government and the government doesn't like it. So just recently, three women were accused of what they call superstitious behavior and receiving money for telling fortunes. So they were tried in a public forum and people were dragged out into the street to witness all of this. And immediately they put to death two of the psychics. That is awful. And the third one, life in prison. So they are really cracking down on even spiritual connection here with other people. And anybody who is advising people in North Korea psychically or trying to give them some direction, possibly some hope in such a bleak country. And this is what is happening. So it's very sad. That story is also on our Facebook page, as well as many others that we've been posting all week long. We have so much more to talk to you about, about what is being hidden from us. It's going on. Now, you know the truth. Aliens, ETs, interdimensionals, they're all real. They can't hide it anymore. Too much is coming out. And tonight, you're going to hear about what happened before Roswell. Now, before I introduce... Paul Blake Smith to you. Just wanted to remind you to support our sponsors. Astridian.love is the new website for our skincare line that we are so happy to have on board with us. It is a mineral-rich 
line, everything natural, highly concentrated. And if you use the code SUPERNATURAL, they're going to give you 10% off and send you free samples. So be sure to go to astridian.love. That's A-S-T-R-I-D-I-A-N dot love. And you can buy whatever you need for your skin right there on that website. Brand new, and it is a great product line. I use it myself. It's tremendous. So let's get to the meat of this show because this is something I have really looked forward to. and I'm so grateful that author and expert Paul Blake Smith is with us tonight because, guess what, everybody? Three gray aliens crash-landed their small circular spaceship in a field outside of Cape Girardeau on what appears to have been Saturday evening, April 12, 1941. Now, Paul Blake Smith is the author, as I mentioned, of Three Presidents, Two Accidents, and... M041, the bombshell before Roswell. Now, Paul was born and raised in the hometown of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. He is the son of a paralegal and an educator who worked in the suspected crash area. Paul is a fan of American history and popular culture, living and working in a city in the western part of the Show Me State. He writes original screenplays and books on largely historical nonfiction subjects, including this follow-up to his original fact-based publication about a massive cover-up by the U.S. government. We know it's going on. So, Paul Blake Smith, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, great to have you on. This is something, this is news to me, and I thought I knew about all, all UFO crashes but this is a great book. I just have to tell everybody, I couldn't put it down. It's very well written. You're a, a great writer. So tell us how you got involved with this story. I began to hear uh, just bits and pieces of this around the year 2000. And I thought, oh, boy, this is my hometown. I'd love to hear more. Where can I get a book? And as the years went by, there's no book. There's just a few uh, paragraphs, a few chapter mentions briefly in other UFO books, and I thought, no one's investigated this? No one's written a whole book and dug into this? Someone needs to do something. So I figured, I'm someone. I'm a writer. This is my (laughs) own hometown. I'd better get on it myself. So I did. That took about four or five years and uh, wrote this book that got released in 2016. And there was so much a response from it and some more stories that came in, and I had extra material, so I created a second book called Three Presidents, Two Accidents. Well, this is quite the dramatic story, and again, it's amazing to me this has been very well hidden, and how did you get to dig this stuff up? I mean, what was the first thing that you started looking for to to find out all this information? You have all the information in your book. How did you it find was, it? Yeah. Deeply frustrating because it was uh, over about 75 years later. Everyone was sworn to secrecy at the time. Uh, There were uh, just little bits of rumors floating about in the air. I managed to talk to some people. They were getting pretty on. And so many people had passed on. And in many cases, their children are passed on. And there are uh, just a few documents floating around uh, that make reference to the Missouri discovery of 1941. Uh, if you want to know more about that, you can go to MajesticDocuments.com or SeekingMoInfo.com. These are two excellent sites with UFO documents. But that was part of the story. And then I uh, started to look online and find information in uh, uh, topics forum about some local people who had um, uh, looked into the case a little bit, and they had information to share, including one young man who claimed, uh, my grandparents own the farm, where the crash occurred and wouldn't tell me much about it. So I went back to this area and looked it up, and there was this old man who had bought the farm from my parents after World War II, and he told me he was digging in the dirt and found these weird bits of metal with strange imprint symbols on it, and and he couldn't tear or cut it with the sharpest kind of cutting blades he had on his farm. And it was just the strangest thing. He had not been told of any crash, the old man. So he said he gathered up all this stuff that he pulled out of the dirt, and put it in his barn, and he won't tell me what he did with it, uh, according to the young uh, man on, for, on the forum. So 
It's another oh, no. frustrating aspect. Yeah, I'm sure the old man is probably deceased by now, and he hid his goodies, and who knows, maybe those got swiped by somebody. But it's another exciting, tantalizing aspect of the story that there could be some still physical remnants of spaceship crash debris uh, just uh, hidden, hidden away, maybe even a safety deposit box. It could be. and Gosh, wouldn't we love to get our hands on it, huh? Oh, yeah. But, you would be making history. Oh, really? Now, this was an interesting crash and uh, for a number of reasons. But what was most interesting to me is it seemed to take the government a bit of time to get themselves there and start interfering and, and swearing people <laughs> to secrecy. So that was kind of interesting that it took them a while. To figure right. out what the was newspapers really uh, sent their own uh, photographers, two of them apparently, with big old flash cameras they used back in those days, and started uh, digging into the story, thinking they've got a big tale to tell. And this should have right. been the biggest bombshell of all time, because Roswell, you know, no one had heard of Roswell. That was six years later of the UFO crash in 47. Uh, America was not even in World War II yet. Much of the world was. We were still uh, kind of neutral when this crash occurred on a farm outside of Cape Girardeau, about a dozen miles or so from uh, the downtown area. Cape was a town of about 20,000 people back then. And the media started uh, recording the story until the military showed up and said, we'll take those notes, we'll take that camera and that film. And uh, they stole every bit of evidence. Um, A a fireman who was there at the scene says uh, the story is true. I know I was there fighting the fire from the crash. I saw the bodies, I saw the spaceship, and I tried to um, sneak a piece of debris in my pocket, and the Army caught me and forced me to give it back, and they kicked me out of the site. He said they followed me around town and even bugged my telephone afterwards. So Ah. uh, this is according to the fireman's grandson. Now, I know anyone can make up a story, but I did uh, find out that someone had abruptly quit the fire department, according to the Cape Girardeau newspapers, uh, shortly after this event. And that was forcing the mayor to find someone new. And it kind of fits with uh, what we know in the official records. But it's just another tantalizing tale that might piece together one of the great stories that many Americans have not heard yet. No, they have not. And it is an incredible story. Now, tell us, give us some of the background. Now, obviously, people should go and buy both of your books so they get all of the details. But if you can give the audience some understanding of what happened that night. Uh, According to the first uh, narrative of the story, it was uh, from a woman named Charlotte Huffman Mann. She said her grandmother told her the story when she was ill with cancer and got the whole thing out, knowing she was going to die in the early 1980s. She said, um, back in uh, April of 1941, we got a phone call uh, just after dark. Must have been like 8.30, 9 o'clock. And uh, Reverend William Huffman was called out to um, what they thought was an airplane crash in a farm field about a dozen miles from downtown Cape Girardeau. Well, uh, a a member of the um, Cape Girardeau Police Department in an unmarked car or an associate of the police came by and picked Reverend Huffman up expecting a plane crash with, uh, I'm sorry to say, gruesome body parts, injured people, uh, people seeking spiritual comfort, maybe even um, the survivors' families showing up, and uh, people being very upset. He knew he was in for a tough night. Uh, right. It was a very religious community back then, very Christian church going. So they naturally called a Christian pastor to go to this, uh, uh, well, a pastor to go to the pasture and uh, see what had crashed. When he got there, he said, "Well, there was." A crashed vehicle, all right, but there were no wings. It was not cylindrical. It was circular. There was, like, no propeller and and no uh, uh, engine that we could see. It was just a, a disc, a silver disc uh, made of metal, and he said it was cracked open and you could see inside. And while firefighters were extinguishing a blaze in this field uh, the night of what I feel was April 12th, uh, it's the best guess, I think it's pretty accurate, Uh, Other farm people had shown up. The FBI were there. Uh, The military eventually showed up. 
and uh, the news people were there. The sheriff was there and some deputies, and they were pouring over this uh, crash debris, shiny metal in a field, and three really weird bodies. They were only about uh, four and a half feet tall, big, round, bulbous heads, your typical grays with black eyes, huge black eyes, long, thin arms and legs with three fingers and a thumb, long digits, and they had either crinkly um, skin or the um, flight suits were very metallic and crinkly, one of the two. It could be that um, either the flight suits or their uh, epidermis, their skin, uh, reacted negatively to our oxygen-rich atmosphere. And the creatures, two of them were dead, Reverend Huffman said. They were laid out side by side. Someone, he was told someone had pulled them from the crash. And a third one was just barely alive. His chest was still breathing. He's still respirating. And as Reverend Huffman knelt down to say some prayers and looked this creature over, he said he made sure not to touch it, but the creature just went still, and it was obviously dead. So these were sentient beings, obviously um, once alive, now dead, that um, had crashed in a, I, I don't know how to put it otherwise, a circular spaceship from another planet or dimension and that um, he got a little uh, peek inside the craft, and there were tiny, a couple tiny chairs, uh, some instruments and an instrument panel, gauges and dials, and a strange silver metallic band around the, uh, I guess you would call the ceiling or upper uh, walls of the interior of the craft with weird symbols on them that he'd never seen before and he couldn't describe, almost like hieroglyphics. Well, um, people were picking up the debris and, and holding up the bodies, and uh, one uh, photographer got a big flash picture of uh, one of the aliens being propped up. He was, of course, dead. His arms were outstretched, almost like, a, looky what we found. We're going to make history with this blockbuster news story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, the sheriff had a brother who was in a um, military unit in Sykeston, Missouri, about 30 miles down the road, and they came barreling in, uh, let's say, 9.30, uh, 10 o'clock at night, and said, we're taking over. We'll take every bit of evidence. You're not to speak of this ever again. We'll take those notes and all the film, uh, the camera film and the, uh, the pictures you've taken. Uh, they swore each person to secrecy, including Reverend Huffman, and said this didn't, did not happen. This was a matter of national security. You're never to talk about this ever and they really threw a, a scare into some people. And uh, Reverend Huffman got in his uh, car with his police associate and drove back home. And uh, his family noticed that he was pale and shaken and must have been getting close to midnight. And they said, what's going on? Where have you been? What's happened? So he said, I'm going to tell you this story once, and then I'm never going to speak of it again. And apparently he pretty much lived up to that uh, word. And uh, he told them the whole story, even though he had been sworn to secrecy. And uh, it, it was so shocking that the family keep it, kept it largely hidden, especially away from their grandchildren as the 1950s progressed. Yeah, I mean, this is 1941. I can't even imagine what went through their minds when they, they saw this. This craft split open, three dead aliens or two dead, one dying, and fire around the craft. But it was small. You said the craft was Definitely not set up for interstellar travel as we would imagine it. It was like a short burst of, you know, distance. So maybe from the sh a larger ship to Earth, like a probably scout like ship. a scout ship. Yeah, a scout ship mm -hmm. that was probably released. If we want to speculate logically from a mothership, uh, this was a little scout ship. And it's um, a question I often get when I'm interviewed. Well, why didn't the aliens come back for their dead uh, cousins or you know their spaceship and everything? I don't have an answer for that. They uh, may have been um, unaware that it crashed or they didn't care. Uh, I've been told in my research uh, by one gentleman that there was a second crash site that night, and I put that in oh. my second book. And it, it was more like uh, a smaller object. And when I was talking to investigator Linda Moulton Howe, she was mentioning all of her Roswell uh, research shows that there was a second crash site that and it was speculated by the military that uh, as the craft went down in the Nevada or the New Mexico desert, uh, it ejected a um, uh, like a landing pod or an emergency pod, and that crashed. Well, if we can uh, track back from that, that could be well what happened in Colorado, that um, a kind of emergency pod 
uh, ejected from the craft as it went down from the uh, upper atmosphere down to Earth and uh, landed in someone's yard about a mile away from the crash. And so I wasn't able to find out much information on that, but it's a, a fascinating story all around. It should have been the biggest bombshell news in American history, really, maybe even human history. But the military squelched it right away. Uh, they wanted um, uh, any sort of advantage of a secret weapon that we could use against um, uh, the Nazis were our main concern, possibly the Japanese. We were not involved in World War II, but it was looking more and more likely every day. And we wanted to get any advantage and keep it a secret away from the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the Axis powers. So uh, everyone was sworn to secrecy, and only a few people talked. And one of those who did a little bit walked up to Reverend Huffman two weeks after the crash and said, I have this photograph of an alien, and I want you to have a copy. And he handed it over, and he uh, sped along his way because there was a real atmosphere of fear in Cape Girardeau in those days. You didn't want to talk um, because the uh, military told you not to. You didn't want to be unpatriotic. And uh, you wanted to do exactly what your government told you back then. So yeah, Reverend back Huffman, then, that's how it was. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it was a much different atmosphere, we have to understand, than today, where we're critical of our government. And it turns out they were involved in scandalous cover-ups and conspiracies, and in other cases, UFOs are not. But back then, there was almost nothing to call upon and, and uh, any precedent for this. Uh, you might have read a Buck Rogers comic strip or a comic book that would give you the only the faintest uh, creative fiction idea of what uh, outer space would be like or creatures, and it was considered probably pretty silly business to most adults. Uh, it's uh, interesting to know that Cape Girardeau was also uh, the home of a National Guard armory where many citizens were also part of the Army and had their ears open uh, and on the job around town during the day, and that made you even more afraid. In 1906, we had a young uh, uh, Army enlistee who had trained in Cape Girardeau and lived that summer in Cape Girardeau. His name was Harry S. Truman, and he oh was a United States senator, yes, uh, in 1941 in Washington, and he had a sudden strange attack in his chest, uh, chest pains, and they thought it was a heart attack, apparently that night or shortly thereafter. And uh, it turns out it was mostly gallstones. But he was in Washington at the time, and uh, he had uh, campaigned in Cape Girardeau the previous November, I believe it was, or at least the fall campaign, uh, where he was running for Senate again in 1940. So uh, Harry was kind of a fairly powerful senator who was ready to start some uh, military uh, funding and financing uh, hearings on Capitol Hill the following Monday, and so uh, he was around the Capitol building, which if you were reading, if you're up to like chapter two or three, you see where that yes. connection comes in. Yes, yes, this is amazing. And again, you know, it is really important to stress the difference in consciousness between now and then. I mean, now people see the government in a lot of ways as the enemy because they've been hiding things from us especially about UFOs and the technology that they have recovered and reverse engineered, as well as, now here's another thing I want to mention, Paul, and get your take on. There have been a lot of guests on the show that also talk about deals that were made between the aliens and our government so that we could get more technology. And in return, we would allow the aliens or the ETs or whatever you want to call them to take human beings and either abduct them and bring them back or just abduct them. Now, what's your yeah, take so on that? I had uh, not much knowledge until the past four months. That's when I've been doing some uh, extensive, intensive research on a story that's even bigger and more exciting to me than the, own, uh, the Cape Girardeau crash, my own hometown, uh, dead aliens, and that's the story of Dwight Eisenhower being called to an air base and speaking to some alien beings face-to-face, -face, and I know that sounds crazy, but the more I dig into this and put together the information, I believe it really did happen, and it's uh, just a huge blockbuster story that seems to have been uh, somewhat dismissed, and it's known in UFO circles, but uh, once again, I'm looking around, where is there a single solid book on this, and I can't find any, so I uh, well, I'll write it, 
and that's what I'm up to. I'm getting fairly close to finishing. I hope to get it out later this year. Oh, gosh. Well, we've got to have you back on the show to talk about everything you've discovered because, you know, again, we've had so many guests that have talked about this deal that was made. And, of course, if the government did make a deal like this, there is no way to know how many people they're taking. I mean, there's no way to monitor it. There's no way to stop it. So and it's the, one of the – Yeah, and the – And the deal was apparently initiated by President Eisenhower that night. He wanted to secure the safety of this country, and he knew that they had superior technology, and he had to do something. So he created this uh, treaty, and uh, apparently it was not really possible on either side, but a deal was struck. Yes, I believe there was one. I I mean, that's what my gut tells me, is that, yeah, that's probably true. And – that may be one of the biggest reasons why the government does not want to have any disclosure around this. Because if this ever came out, I mean, it's not people being scared of aliens. It's people being scared of what the government did. And how, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, we were just some type of, uh, I don't know, a barter for something else that they wanted. And it's, it's, it's unacceptable, obviously. And I think it would ire and people would just be out of their minds with anger if they knew that this was, in fact, a deal that that did take place. Uh, George Knapp is the famous TV reporter in Las Vegas who dug into Area 51. He said there's more people I speak to that are afraid of the government than there are uh, uh, being uh, nervous about aliens. That's how scary the government (laughs) can come cracking down on you if you talk. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Now, have you had any issues with the government since your books have come out? No, I haven't. Uh, No one's bothered me whatsoever. How disappointing, oh, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe they figure it's uh, this is water under the dam because <clears throat> it's so old. But it's just still very significant. Now, one of the points you bring out in the book about this story is it's kind of like this was a rehearsal, this whole thing that happened in 41, because when Roswell happened, they pretty much had their act together and moved in a lot quicker. That's correct. And where did they learn to do this? What could they have used <laughs> as a template? Hmm, I can't guess. Could it have been the Army response and the cover-up in Cape Girardeau six years earlier causing them to create this uh, intelligence team that would move in and box up stuff and hush witnesses and threaten people, frankly? It was kind of an ugly business, but they did it in the name of national security to keep uh, people from panicking and maybe even affecting the stock market, and nobody wanted another Wall Street crash. Yeah, and and with Roswell, I mean, it, from the people we've had on the show that investigated the uh, threats that occurred, it, the, they even threatened grandchildren of people that had witnessed the Roswell situation and threatened to kill their whole families. I mean, they were they oh, seemed my. to get nastier, much nastier yeah. than they were in 1941. We lose track sometimes that we live in a democratic society that the people we send to washington and into our military represent us and work for us and this is how they treat us it's pretty yes, outrageous right i think so i think it's absolutely horrible and it, it seems to be going on uh today not to the same degree i think they probably must have had a different well a change of of mo because everybody's got a cell phone so everybody can take photographs, video, do recordings, mm-hmm. and they, they can't stop it. And there's so many places to post it. So what I heard from an FBI agent was they've just decided not to comment, you know, when these things come out, whether it is or it isn't. Uh, no comment they feel is the best they can do with all this information leaking out everywhere. That's true, but uh, the waters have been muddied by the fact you can doctor up videos now and make fakes, and sometimes these fraudulent videos uh, go online and you can pick them apart. There's uh, uh, CGI and stuff like that, so you don't know what's real and what's not anymore. That's a shame. I really don't like that when people decide that they're going to uh, use their talents with Photoshop and try to you know try to give us something that's not real i mean keep it out of there go make your own movie and call it fiction but let the people that really want to know the truth see real photos and real videos and i do think there's a bunch of them out there i've seen a lot of them that again it's really hard to tell when people are masters at cgi but i think there are a number of things out there that are the real deal and it's great it's great when they come out i agree 
So we're going to take a very short commercial break, and then we're going to come back because there's so much more to this story. And I want you to be able to share so much more with everybody. And again, I'm so happy you're here. This is an amazing occurrence, and it's time everybody learned about it. So stay tuned, everybody. You're listening to Supernatural Girls Radio. We'll be right back. Are you ready for a new experience of freedom and powerful connection? Would you like a positive, effortless change in your life? Then come to CosmicFusion.com, where we offer the most advanced energy clearing and expansion techniques in the world with a quantum vortex energy to activate your divine blueprint and life's purpose. When your soul leads the way with cosmic fusion and quantum vortex energy, you can break clear of past difficulties and blocks with the power of the source. With cosmic fusion, the source energy does the work for you. It's easy and effortless. Listen to our free meditation right from our Cosmic Fusion website, the Cosmic Code Meditation. Sign up for one of our interactive webinars today. Come to Cosmic Fusion, www.kosmicfusion.com to experience an effortless awakening and transformation. Are you ready for an upgrade? Are you ready for a new experience of living in the fifth dimensional magic and powerful connection? Then visit CosmicFusion.com today. CosmicFusion.com Your property tax bill. Have you seen it lately? It's frightening. Your property taxes are going up while your home value is going down. It's time to fight back and win. For the real truth about the property tax system, get Attorney Pat Quintilian's book, Are you getting screwed on your property taxes? How to find out and how to fix it. Attorney Quintilian answers all your questions and gives you the facts you need to fight a property tax bill that is spiraling out of control. You'll also read about what happens to property owners who don't check their property records, only to find out too late they're taxed on square footage, fixtures, and even buildings that they don't own. Is this happening to you? Learn your rights. Buy Attorney Pat Quintilian's book today. Are you getting screwed on your property taxes? How to find out and how to fix it. Available on Amazon.com. Pure essential oil, specialized mineral, and a revolutionary anti-aging technology. Astridium combines the best of all scientifically proven ingredients in easy-to-use creams, lotions, and concentrated serums. Astridian's advanced line of products take your skin to a new level of being healthy and beautiful. We offer a variety of collections that address all your skin concerns. The Essential Anti-Aging Series treats and moisturizes your skin for a long-lasting, younger look. The Multivitamin Series promotes healthy skin with high-quality vitamins and minerals. The Sports Series restores skin from cellular damage and stress. Astridian also offers a revitalizing solution for hair and a professional series for doctors and medical spas. Visit astridian.love today and begin your new journey to healthy, beautiful, youthful skin. Astridian, beyond your expectations. Welcome back, everyone, to Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker, and I am here with author and expert Paul Blake Smith. We are talking about the crash before Roswell. Now, Paul, was there any reports that you could dig up about autopsies that were done on these aliens that were recovered? Not per se. There's a few mentions um, in memorandums from none other than President Roosevelt who talked about... um, these wonder, the celestial wonders that have just come to us and forming a, uh, a ter- non-terrestrial science and technology committee to deal with these things that um, have taken everyone by surprise, uh, possibly um, uh, a 1942 um, Battle of Los Angeles recovered uh, crap, but certainly in the 1941 Cape Girardeau uh, affair, producing bodies and uh, needing autopsies and quite frequently in UFO documents, according to Lane Wood, 
Dr. Van Ever Bush was a top scientist, uh, most respected and revered by everyone, especially FDR. And uh, guess who went strolling into the White House for a meeting in the Oval Office with FDR just a few days after the Cape Girardeau crash? It's Dr. Van Ever Bush, and uh, he would undoubtedly have been consulted about uh, uh, doing an autopsy on the recovered craft. And uh, a physician was also called in at that time who would have undoubtedly been trusted with the bodies. Let's find out what makes both tick. Uh, I'm sure this would have been top secret material. Uh, President Roosevelt referred to these as uh, affairs of state or state secrets. So uh, he wanted to weaponize basically whatever he could to give us an advantage in uh, the impending war. And I feel that he did. But I really would love to see uh, some autopsy reports on Cape Girardeau specifically. I bet they would match up with most any um, reports you got from your typical gray crash recovery, gray alien. Oh, yes, it sounds that way. And there has also been some talk about the aliens being part of robotic or something like that. They're not full biological beings. Have you heard about that? Yeah. I have heard, and uh, while it may be somewhat speculative, it makes sense in that they were all three identical, as if they just came out of a cookie cutter or a jello mold. Uh, they all had the same features and uh, either wore the same thing or had the same uh, crinkled skin. And so uh, if they were individuals like you and I, how come there were <laughs> no differences between them? Uh, they could right. be somewhat mass manufactured by a higher intelligence, a, a more humanoid type of alien who wanted like an assistant or um, uh, a robotic um, uh, obedient slave, and they created these um, uh, entities that would uh, follow their dictates. Uh, it's it, You can go all sorts of directions because, once again, the government has hidden the facts from us. But uh, you get things in dribs and drabs, and one of those is uh, androids and uh, the kind of technology that uh, America's probably working on right now. Uh, yes, exactly. And it makes that would kind of add up as to why um, other aliens wouldn't come back to retrieve them. Yeah, they wouldn't care that much. They're just like um, uh, maybe uh, worker bees. Slaves. Worker bees or shepherd dogs or <laughs> the things that uh, creatures right. that took their orders and they're a dime a dozen. We'll just go get some more. Uh, yes. I would imagine any um, higher intelligence though would want to keep their spaceship away from human beings to you know recover and, and weaponize and uh, reverse engineer and such. But that was not the case. Uh, none came back in Cape Girardeau. It was all scooped up that night by the military and taken to an air base. Um, apparently in Sykeston, and the next day flown to Washington, where we get into another weird, wild twist in the story. Yes, let's go there. What happens next? There's a report from uh, a Reverend um, Turner from Ohio, who was a cousin of Cordell Hull, FDR's Secretary of State. And uh, Reverend uh, uh, Huffman had nothing to do with this in Cape Girardeau. It was Reverend uh, Turner Hamilton Holt, I believe was his full name. Well, Reverend Holt uh, went to Washington to visit uh, his uh, cousin. They were pretty good friends. And uh, Secretary Holt said, I've got something I want you to see. Uh, I want you to swear to never tell anyone what you're about to see ever again. So he swore them on the steps of the U.S. Capitol building, where Harry Truman worked, by the way. And they went down inside the U.S. Capitals about seven or eight stories below the uh, legislative, legislative uh, offices and, and buildings where Congress works every day. This was undoubtedly the uh, Passover Easter break where no one was around. So it was a perfect time to hide something. And uh, Cordell Hole led this man down a hall to this special locked uh, storeroom. And they went inside, turned on the lights. And inside, Reverend Holt said, there was a cut-up circular spacecraft. It was in, like, pie pieces. It was made of silver and uh, silver metal or nickel and shiny. And it was obviously crashed open at one point. And there was a box of debris, shrapnel. And there were three uh, bodies, three dead aliens in three glass jars. Uh, this was recalled by the daughters of Turner Holt 
who said that Daddy told us this story one time that there were these uh, re- crash recoveries taken to a special storeroom below the U.S. Capitol building. Now, I know that sounds like something out of the National Enquirer, but I got a, a confirmation from this and a phone call about two years ago from a gentleman who said, my father worked for the uh, Franklin Roosevelt administration, and on my last day of school in May of 1941, he took me on the uh, Capitol building subway, and we went underneath the Capitol, and my dad led me from the train inside the Capitol, down some corridors, and he opened up this special storeroom, and he said, there were the aliens in glass jars and a box of debris and the metallic ship in pieces. He said, that whole story is true. I saw it as a little boy. It was my last day of school. My dad just simply said, oh, this must be some sort of storeroom. Let's keep moving. And they turned around and walked out. But he, this oh man wanted God. me to know that uh, the, the story is wild, but it is true. So when you think about it, where else would the military and the government and FDR confined to a wheelchair well, put this recovered material from Cape Girardeau, at least in the immediate uh, term, uh, where they could study it, where the um, possibly heads of Congress and the military, uh, the trusted generals and everyone who was assembled in Washington, where could they go? Well, well down below the Capitol in this special storeroom, uh, I, I was uh, even um, uh, watching a 60 Minutes piece a few years ago, and they went down in the uh, several floors below the Capitol building and with their camera and showed this special storeroom down the hall with the door shut. And they, and they said, we're not allowed to film anymore. But I thought, boy, this sounds just like the Cape Girardeau story. And they put uh, at least some of what they learned on the air on 60 Minutes. It was a report about uh, 9-11 and uh, where that report was stored in a special storeroom down below the Capitol where supposedly other secrets were being held. So that oh, report from a few years ago, yeah, uh, it, it was quote, most fascinating. And then the story of the man who called me said his father worked for FDR. And so, so there's that story, and it meshes with the uh, the daughters of Turner Holt, who said that our daddy told us this crashed aliens. He did not say specifically where they were from. But obviously, three dead aliens, a crashed ship, it all matches up with Cape Girardeau. And it shows you the mindset at the time of, goodness, where do we take this? So at one point, I'm sure they had to decide what lab do we uh, take the bodies to, what hospital more do we autopsy them, uh, where do we take this wreckage where uh, people with flight, uh, air, air flight uh, technology and engineering skills can reverse engineer this. So it didn't stay there probably too long. I'm imagining maybe a month or two below the Capitol building. But uh, FDR was keen to get this stuff examined so we could learn all that we could and get it for our advantage, these celestial wonders, as you call them. And uh, Linda Moulton Howe has done good work in uh, showing how the uh, atomic propulsion device within the Cape Girardeau crash was applied to the atom bomb and could have changed history. I know it sounds wild, but it could have perfected the, uh, uh, the, uh, the workings, the, the building of the atom bomb, which was going on at the time, and suddenly it was all finished under the watchful eye of Dr. Van Heer Bush. So it, the Cape Girardeau crash may have helped win World War II for America and supposedly uh, could be applied to other weapons to this day. And I'll just throw this in. Uh, you, we hear so many times of UFOs hovering over missile bases and possibly yes. even somehow disarming missiles. Well, if we stole their technology and put it into atomic missiles, this is how they know to go there and uh, disable or disarm the weapons that we <laughs> copied off of uh, what they had in wow. the Cape Girardeau UFO crash. You know, you raise a really interesting fact here. That's a really good thought. I love it. We've had Robert Salas on the show, who was present at one of the bases where they had the nuclear missiles and the UFOs came and shut everything down. And, again, very credible witness, a part of the military, and he just told us, yes, this is what happened. Plenty of witnesses. So it's interesting, though, what you're adding to the mix about we had the technology that we reverse engineered or got somehow from the aliens anyway. So no wonder they had the ability, besides that they're so far advanced uh, beyond what where we are. I mean, we're probably like little ants to them. But it's, uh, it's just amazing how you're bringing... T- with your books and with your research, lots more pieces of the puzzle together. Good work, Paul. This is great stuff. Well, 
I love it. I uh, thank you. And uh, there's even another quick story I could mention that uh, ties yes. this in. There's been yeah. a UFO researcher who found a, a scientist who was at a 1962 nuclear test site um, uh, with some other scientists, and apparently they were playing cards and waiting for this nuclear bomb detonation to go off. And they uh, they started talking about, well, where we get this uh, great advances in nuclear uh, atomic weapons? And he said, oh, we stole it from a spaceship crash in the Ozarks in 1941. And they oh, said, my what? Goodness. what? <laughs> yeah, and he <laughs> said, uh, it, yeah, it happened in the Ozarks, and we got this technology and we copied it. And he and, and this uh, other scientist remembered this and reported it many years later, and it all fits that uh, we got yes, atomic secrets to uh, get the advantage over our enemies from the Cape Girardeau UFO crash. Gosh, well, they were really taken unawares by this crash. It sounds like it was the first time they ever had to deal with it then. Yeah, uh, I don't know how many other crashes there are. And uh, I will also add as a side note, I've never seen a UFO myself. I know uh, nothing about um, firsthand witnesses uh, of um, any other story. Uh, I've not investigated like Roswell or San Augustine, I think is the name of the place. Or uh, I'm reading in my Eisenhower uh, book research today that there was a crash of a disc in the Oregon-California border one month before Eisenhower went on this uh, special trip to Edwards Air Force Base to speak to aliens. So there are apparently a number of other crashes. An excellent book uh, for looking it up is called Magic Eyes Only by Ryan S. Wood. He's an excellent mm-hmm. researcher. He's collected all sorts of tales, and there's a good-sized chapter on Cape Girardeau. Uh, he was able to help me from time to time with uh, answers to questions I had in emails, and so he's a good fellow. And uh, I was able to um, contact only a few other people because I was such a nobody. Uh, I tried to contact, let's say, MUFON, and they never even got back to me because uh, who, Paul? Oh, said, my who's gosh. This? <laughs> yeah. Oh. So um, uh, I, I'm not critical. I just that I'm a complete nobody, at least at that time. I probably still am. But uh, <laughs> it was tough to research this book. Uh, being a, a, a novice, this was my first book. And I think it turned out pretty well. It got good reviews, and you could see the cover of it and the mention of Cape Girardeau in Ancient Aliens. Uh, I think it ran in 2017 uh, on a, a story on Ancient Aliens uh, beyond Roswell, and they show my book cover and talk about uh, Reverend Huffman and the Cape Girardeau story, uh, you know, but only briefly. And it made a sci-fi channel called The Secret uh, Evidence That We're Not Alone. That came out in 2002. And it showed about two minutes worth of the Reverend Huffman story in Cape Girardeau. But otherwise, we've kind of gone under the radar. It seems pretty unfair that Roswell stole all our thunder. But um, <laughs> if yeah. I have my way, we'll, we'll get it out there one of these days on a massive scale. Well, as I said, I loved reading your book. It, it is a very exciting book to read. There's so many more details to all of this. And it's the way you wrote about these people. They really come to life. And I was trying to place myself in that time and that place and imagine what it would have been like because it's not like it is today where people see, you know, UFOs all over YouTube and they're hearing about it on Ancient Aliens or on Project Blue Book. I mean, it didn't have anywhere near the media exposure that we have now. So this must have been really shocking to those people back then. Really shocking. That's the, yeah, that's the impression I got. Now, I try to cram every bit of fact I can get into my books and the resource or source where I got it and make sure people get their money's worth when they get a copy, which you still can from Argus Publishing, argusbooks.com. But when I find in talking to the people uh, in Cape Girardeau today, some of them have heard the story and say, oh, yeah, I remember that. I saw it on something or heard it somewhere. And other people are still to this day like, what, a crash? What do you mean a UFO yeah. crash here in our Cape Girardeau? They have no clue. If you go to Cape Girardeau, there's no museum. There's no gift shop. There's no bus tour. Um, I think I have a general idea where the crash site is, but I'm not going to tell anyone. Uh, I, right. I could be wrong. But it's uh, these farms that are out in the countryside. These are people's private homes and businesses. They are not fenced in. We can't have a bunch of people, maybe hundreds or thousands of people, showing up demanding to see the evidence or start digging up your yard or your crops. (laughs) 
And and that we, wouldn't be you fun. You just can't. So we can't reveal, uh, even if we knew the exact site, it would be a disaster for the people who live and work there every day. So uh, this is another reason why Cape Girardeau just has to kind of take a back seat to Roswell, even though we came first, I tell you. And you sure did. And I'm so glad that you're you're giving out all of this information because it's a part of our history. And, it, it, again, we're we're talking about... Well, you talk about ancient aliens. I mean, they keep saying that this is where we come from. We come from them. And they've been here for for longer than we can even imagine. So, and I think all of that is really true. But one other thing that came out in your investigation is the fact that people looked inside the ship and they did see strange markings, which they described as looking like hieroglyphics. And you hear right. that a lot from witnesses, right, in other crash sites like Roswell yeah. and other abductees talk about it. And also the um, the landing in on the U.K., in, U, in the U.K., on the military base. They also said the same thing, these hieroglyphic symbols or what looks to be like hieroglyphics. Uh, Linda Moulton Howe has done some interesting work, and not being the world's biggest scientific brainiac, I'm a little bit lost when she says, there's binary code embedded in these symbols and her messages, and it's starting to make more sense. I hope she's able to get these thoughts out. She uh, uh, it will no longer be on uh, Coast to Coast AM with her Earth Files report, to my surprise, but she's continuing her research and appearing at the conventions where she prominently mentions my book, and I'm proud to say she even says, and it's been on tape and they've shown it to me, Linda says, I wish everyone on earth could read this book by Paul Blake Smith. I thought, wow, that's a, and a commercial endorsement right there. Uh, <laughs> that's a great one. It, it, it would change your mind, I think, that if you thought aliens were not here observing us, you might uh, have a complete U-turn. If you're uh, skeptical of Roswell, if you think somehow that was a, a fraud or something, the Cape Girardeau crash might help to change your mind. It does appear we are being observed by various alien races and that they're not perfect. They don't understand our uh, gravity, our electromagnetic atmosphere, our, our uh, uh, gravitational pulls and how storms can come up, just like American pilots crash their airplanes. Aliens can, uh, who are not familiar with this planet uh, can easily crash a spaceship. And you, I often hear that question, well, if aliens are so advanced and smart, how come they keep crashing and ending up dead? And I'm thinking, well, we're so smart, we have all this air flight technology, and we keep crashing, and we know our atmosphere and our weather and the weather reports, and so um, anyone can make a mistake. No one's perfect. Well, that's right, and I've heard that, too, from a lot of skeptics, uh, the same thing. And I think you, you brought up a great answer to that. And and I would guess, I would hazard to guess that with all the many hundreds of thousands of spaceships that we've been visited by, there's just a very, very small number that's crashed compared to how many have been in our atmosphere or have been yeah. uh, watching us or doing other things to us. Uh, yeah, very small percentage that has crashed. So I it, feel it a, is a little cheated. Yeah, I feel a little cheated on a personal level. My grandfather was a judge in Cape Girardeau in 1941. Uh, he had just been city attorney, but my father and uh, my grandmother talked him into giving up the job. Uh, he was so gone from home so often. So he might have been in power on that Saturday night as a city attorney called into the crash site because it would have been a legal matter, and uh, the city had to respond and make sure no one had their goods stolen if it was an airplane crash and that bodies were handled properly. Well, my right. grandfather apparently didn't go to the crash because he had uh. been promoted to a judge, and uh, he didn't talk too much to me as a little boy. He was a pretty quiet man. He had things on his mind. So if he ever knew about the crash, like secondhand stories, uh, he did not tell me. Uh, and he uh, passed on exactly. in 1983. Yeah, so, so there's another missed opportunity. Uh, oh. My grandfather was pretty good friends with a man named Rush Limbaugh the first. Oh wow! He was an attorney. Yeah, he was an attorney in Cape Girardeau and a leading Freemason. And the mayor was a Freemason and uh, a, a notable uh, police officer who may well have been called to the crash site was a Freemason. 
and they uh, keep secrets all the time, and they're interested in astronomy and beyond the stars. I saw a little bit on this uh, on TV just this weekend. And so um, this was another factor in keeping the story squelched and uh, keeping it away from the public. It would have been um, a state secret, but certainly a local secret, maybe shared among Freemasons, but no one in my family was a Freemason, so there's another strike against us. Harry Truman was the uh, Grand Master Freemason for the state of Missouri, and he came to Cape Girardeau uh, uh, in later years and uh, even mentioned how he attended a Masonic meeting, uh, I believe, in Cape. So uh, there's all kinds of roundabout connections. FDR was the president, and he was a 33rd degree Freemason, and so was the vice president at the time, uh, Henry Wallace who had his office every day at the U.S. Capitol building. So there's all kinds of uh, crazy government connections. Uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover was a Freemason, and the FBI opened an office in Cape just one month before the crash. And so they would have uh, been interested in learning everything but uh, keeping the secret for two or three different levels. Yes, yes. Oh, my goodness. Wow, listen to all these connections. It's amazing when you got into this story how many more connections you discovered right within your own family. Yeah. Uh, I was told I never have been able to get through to Rush. I sent him an email, didn't get anything in response. But I've been told he has said he heard the story when he was in high school in the 1960s. And Mm -hmm. uh, someone called in his radio show, his national show, around 2006 or so, and said, Rush, what's up with this uh, spaceship crashing in your own hometown? And instead of dismissing this guy and calling him a kook and saying, get out of here, he said, there's more to this story than you might think. And he moved on oh. to the next caller. Yeah. Wow. He's got a conservative wow. listenership. They probably didn't want him to uh, upset the conservatives listening, but he did not dismiss it. In fact, he just kind of lended credence to it, and he has not spoken out since. Uh, he might have learned the story from his father, who was a World War II pilot and a Korean pilot, a very brave man, or his grandfather, who was a leading Freemason and an attorney in town and and knew plenty of secrets. So uh, Rush, the broadcaster, was my Little League umpire when I was a boy in Cape Girardeau. He called the balls and strikes uh, in a park. Yeah, he was um, an obscure radio broadcaster named Rusty uh, Limbaugh or even Rusty Saw was his radio name back in those days. (laughs) And he had to pick up extra money. Yeah, he picked up extra money by umpiring ball games in the park when I was about 10 or 11 years old. So uh, I've never met Rush. I'd like to talk to him, but I bet even he to this day won't let out what he knows. He has a a conservative reputation to keep intact, and if he wanted to talk about it, he probably would. He might. And, again, you know, he has a specific agenda with his show, which is quite different from a show like ours. But, I, you know, I – I have to tell you, I find a lot of conservative people who embrace all of this information about UFOs and the fact that this has been held from us for so many years. Yeah, conservatives generally distrustful of the government and uh, don't like being uh, covered up or, you know, lied to as such. Um, uh, At least when I was growing up, uh, less government was better. And so there's a natural reaction to uh, stories that FDR, a liberal president, ordered this uh, hushed up from the beginning. But I emphasize once again, no one wanted another uh, 1929 Wall Street crash that if people thought aliens were about to invade or land here and uh, try to speak to us and be ended up uh, revered or worshipped as gods, you know, and people would quit their religion, maybe quit their job, and suddenly the economy which was very fragile in 1941, would come crashing down. And it was another excellent reason to keep this as a matter of uh, secret state affairs. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, I, I think back then, you know, they had their reasons, and now they would say they have other reasons. But it's yeah. gotten fairly fairly tiresome for those of us who have watched UFOs in the sky or been abducted and, and then have had the government follow them around and you know, have black helicopters over their homes. It, it's uh, that part of it's very troubling that that people have been harassed to a great degree 
And these are people, I know some of them personally, they've offered to give the government all the information they have. And instead, the government prefers to spy on them. It just, it, that's not uh, fair, in my opinion. And especially when people want to help. You know, they want to say, look, this is what we learned. This is what we d- discovered. Um, but they're not treated fairly. And I, I find that uh, to be terrible. That's terrible treatment by our government to, to our people here. I have no arguments, but you keep hearing these uh, whispers and rumors that at some point the government's going to unload all the facts and tell us. And they thought maybe Obama would do that in his final days in office or that Trump would blurt something out. But we go by year by year and we get very little. uh, uh, There was uh, some Pentagon information. I think it came out a couple of years ago. And it almost just seemed to get lost, admitting that, yeah, UFOs are here and there were – uh, monitoring the situation, some sort of uh, story like that made the news, and it just didn't make much of a splash with all of the uh, Trump scandals going on in the headlines. Yeah, that uh, made everything take a back seat, unfortunately. Uh, however, there there are more pieces of information, more breadcrumbs that they are handing out. So it almost seems like they want people to become comfortable with the concept. And, you know, there's a lot being said about Tom DeLonge and his involvement in UFOs. A lot of people in the UFO community and just the paranormal community think he's a paid shill or just a shill because why would the government divulge information to him? He's like he's a rock and roll mm-hmm. guy. And yeah. so, you know, there are people that speculate, and that's all we can do at this point, but are speculating that the government made a bad choice and thought that Tom DeLonge would kind of be the Pied Piper leading people along to to learn about UFOs being real. And instead, it's unleashed a fury of criticism uh, towards DeLonge and also the government. So that was a poor choice. I agree with them on that that side, if that is what, in fact, has been going on. So there's, there's a lot of spider webs here. And it's a very uncomfortable feeling. There are people also that have been doing research on this for years like you and feel that the government's now up against some type of a deadline where the agreements they've had with certain uh, ET races have said to them, you have to divulge this by a certain time. Have you heard anything about that? I have not. uh, I have heard that it's quite possible uh, Julian Assange was behind the leaking of the Skinny Bob video, that this was a government secret, uh, this alien, this footage from uh, Russia from 1942 of an alien that matches exactly the description of the 41 Cape Girardeau affair, and that uh, this was leaked onto the government by uh, someone who had hacked in the account of government files. I don't know if that's true. It's a little bit over my pay grade or my head to, <laughs> what uh, is hacked or leaked, but, you know, we live in a day where all kinds of stuff is getting hacked and government secrets to spell out one way or another. I'm still optimistic that somebody will uh, hack a government file and leak it, or the government will just <laughs> release and admit, yeah, we've been holding on to this, and we just didn't want you to panic, but, yeah, we're being observed, we're being visited, there's nothing you can do about it. just go about your business is what I would probably tell people. I think, you're, yeah, yes, that would be a wonderful, happy day. But also, we recently had uh, Robert Bigelow on 60 Minutes talking yeah. about aliens and saying, yeah, they're right under our noses. I, I think it caught the uh, interviewer quite by surprise. <laughs> and I was, I was thrilled. I thought, good for you, Mr. Bigelow. And yeah. so clearly he, he knows a lot about this. He's been collecting all kinds of artifacts and also information, so he would know, and he came right I out. I want and more from him. Yeah, I want more from him and more from Tom DeLong. I give them points for trying, but I'd like to see more. I'd like to see more tangible results. You know, uh, photos, film footage, uh, actual documents. You know, autopsy reports and such. Uh, in my book, I mention a man named Thomas Cantwheel who served in the CIC, the Counterintelligence Corps for the Army, and he was dying of cancer in the late 1990s. I don't know if he got up to this point in my book, but he released a typed-up statement. He, you know, God bless him, he was in his 90s, and he's dying of cancer, and he said, I want to tell you some secrets that I learned in my time in government. And the first thing he wanted to get off his chest was, quote, 
There was an aerodyne that crashed in southern Missouri in 1941. It was the first thing he wanted to tell people was the Cape Toronto oh, UFO God. crash. Yeah. Look at that. So, um, um, yeah, and he, and he uh, said there was a second vehicle that was recovered intact, just like abandoned in Louisiana, and I've heard that rumor before. And he said oh, that really? the government knew about these things. Yeah, we. he said the Army, and I worked later for the CIA, Mr. Cantwell said, and that uh, we kept these things from the public and investigated and tried to uh, turn them into – uh, top flight, new engineering by humans, and with limited success, uh, turning them into planes that could deliver weapons uh, with the atomic uh, propulsion device recovered from Cape Girardeau. So um, there's just another claim. It's hard to prove, absolutely, but uh, the typed-up report is once again amongst the, uh, the documents collected by Ryan Wood at his uh, MajesticDocuments.com. I just thought it was quite interesting that the first thing he wanted to tell people was about the Missouri spaceship crash of 1941. Yeah, that is pretty incredible. Oh, my goodness. Now, y- you also talk about Carol Lombard's death being UFO-related. Tell us about that. I began to uh, read the uh, bits and pieces of that on the Internet uh, for many years ago, like over 15 years ago, that these uh, – Blacked out government documents were released 40 years after Carol Lombard's 1942 death. And they all pointed to these strange lights in the sky over this mountain where her airplane crashed and she died tragically along with about 21 others, including top flight American uh, test pilots. It was an extremely uh, valuable load of uh, uh, human intelligence going across the country raising funds for the uh, war effort to fight the Nazis when uh, her plane mysteriously crashed into the side of a mountain on a crystal clear night. What could have caused Mm. it? Well, it turned out the government was collecting information at the time that the people saw this uh, yellowish or amber colored UFO, maybe a red and yellow one also hovering over the mountain uh, 30 minutes before her plane came along and her plane suddenly lost power And it's uh, reminiscent of the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where you saw Steven Spielberg utilize real UFO stories of how UFOs or spaceships from aliens came along and their power source or system is different from ours and cripples our uh, airplanes or trucks. So you see Richard Dreyfuss struggling to get his truck started. Yes. Entire neighborhoods go dark because the power station is out. Well, this happens. These are real-life stories, and apparently one of the first ones, and it was swept under the rug by the government, happened some months after Cape Girardeau uh, when Carol Lombard's plane crashed. It had come close to this uh, hovering UFO. We'll just call it one, even though there might have been more. Uh, It lost power and went into a nosedive and then pulled up and was making, quote, porpoise dives in the air. Um, Towards the end, before it veered right into a mountain and everyone died instantly, and uh, President Roosevelt kind of hushed this factor up, at least the FBI did. They uh, refused to release documents for 40 years and only under the Freedom of Information Act, heavily redacted, but it still tells you about uh, the various uh, lights, and there was more going on, but it had to be uh, blacked out and covered up. And so I, this is a terrific story. No one's written about this. So I included it in a bonus chapter in my second book, Three Presidents, Two Accidents. And uh, to me, that's the second big accident that was somewhat hushed up at the time, that this was the point where American uh, scientists were reverse engineering the Cape Girardeau uh, crash recovery, the atomic propulsion device, looking over these bodies. Did we pay a price? from uh, uh, an airplane crash, and uh, it's interesting to know that the plane uh, took off from, the at one point, the Dayton area where Wright Field, Wright Patterson, and all that reverse technology uh, was being done, uh, probably even at the time, and had to be utilized for the war effort, and things had to be kept secret. So uh, this made um, me really want to dig for more answers. This is a totally mysterious, exciting story that no one seems to have... Uh, glommed on to before i was glad to get that out i thank you for oh bringing yeah that up. <laughs> yeah this is a this really captured my attention again everything that you've uncovered is so fascinating but one of the things that you said about this <coughs> excuse me is that 
Carol Lombard was warned not to get out of plane by Jean Dixon. Tell us about yes. that. Uh, she was in Los Angeles. She was on her way to a hair styling salon, and out popped uh, Jean Dixon. It was like a young 16, 17-year-old, I think, at the time. And she uh, shook hands with Carol Lombard and had a terrible premonition. She said, oh, Miss Lombard, you must stay out of the air for the next, uh, like, six weeks. I see great danger for you. There might have been a second uh, psychic warning. There were a number of warnings from uh, other people associated with Carol that something terrible was going to happen. In fact, the head of the Treasury Department called her the night before she left and urged her again, do not go by airplane, uh, like you had a bad feeling. She went with a publicist who woke up in a cold sweat uh, the night before he left on this bond selling tour with Carol and said, I just dreamed that I was in a horrible plane crash, and if we go by airplane on this trip, I will not survive. I will not come home alive. And uh, the man, of course, died in the airplane crash. He was not able to talk Carol Lombard out of going. This was January of 42. Her own mother warned her, it's not safe. I have a terrible feeling. Please don't take the airplane home. She felt she needed to get home to her husband, who was having an affair, Clark Gable, the famous movie star. So uh, she rushed home too quickly, and her plane encountered these uh, strange UFOs in Nevada over Mount Potosi, and it crashed. And it's not far from where many other UFO sightings have been over the years, Area 51, uh, S-4, and all that sort of stuff. So uh, I was glad to piece all of that together and give readers a really uh, interesting story that they've never seen before. Like I said, I like to cram as much really juicy Fact-filled information and not get off on crazy uh, conspiracy tangents, you know, wild alien invasion threats and all that stuff. I try to give just the facts, ma'am. Well, you do a great job. I, I've said that even right at the beginning of the show. The books that you have written are excellent. And now let me ask you some questions just to speculate. Because you said these documents about this plane crash were heavily redacted. Any speculation on what they're trying to cover up? Probably the fact that uh, this alien craft, this is just speculation on my part, the craft got too close to this TWA flight and crippled, maybe accidentally, its um, power system and caused it to crash. Uh, The crash was officially blamed on pilot error. Even though the pilots had taken off from Las Vegas many times, and uh, the pilot uh, who was in charge had just taken off from Las Vegas the week before, and they knew all about the dangerous mountain ranges. Uh, The mountains were even snow-capped. It was January of 1942, and on a crystal clear night, it should have been plain as the nose on their faces, and yet they smashed head-on at over 220 miles per hour. Everyone killed instantly, and there's no telling what they had on board, but they had a tremendous load of mail, and uh, these airline pilots uh, that, uh, or rather these um, uh, Army Uh, training pilots were on board with their gear and their equipment, and it was a huge mess. It was a national tragedy. People remembered where they were when they heard this news. It's a little lost to us now, uh, 75 or more years later, but uh, there were so many people that warned Carol Lombard, including a stagehand who said, I had a dream the night before that her plane crashed into a mountain, and he even got the letters P-O-T something S something I spelled out in the sky and of course she died uh, on Mount Potosi so uh, oh, my it's, just, it's one eerie tale after another on the Lombard story uh, even uh, a 1935 magazine article showed her learning to fly an airplane and uh, hitting the side of a mountain peak and the mountain says ouch in response and this was years before she died I mean it, it, it's oh, just my uncanny How some of these strange. things yeah. Yeah. that is very uh, strange well it you know, it's a good lesson to everybody when you're getting these warning signs. Pay attention. Yeah, so many really. people, and probably now more than we even know, you know, were connected on some level and knew that this was a bad thing for her to do. But as you mentioned, she was desperate to get home to her husband who was having an affair with, who was it, Lana Turner or somebody at the time? That's correct, yeah, yeah. And uh, she thought she needed to save her marriage. And uh, she also wanted to go to a premiere of a movie called To Be or Not to Be that she starred in, (laughs) ironic, in which uh, she says during the course of the movie, what could happen on an airplane? 
And <laughs> so uh, that oh, had to be cut God. from the uh, final movie. Yeah, uh, they released the movie later, and it was a big smash hit. It's a comedy classic. But they cut out the part where Carol Lombard blurts out, well, what could happen in an airplane? Mm. Uh, it's just so sad. Uh, it just seemed like one of those things that were meant to be, I guess. Yeah, it's it's terribly sad. It sounds like, again, though, she was given a lot of choices, a lot of attempts to choose differently, and she just didn't. And it's so unusual that there were so many trained pilots on that flight. So you know That's it right. couldn't have been pilot error. I mean, I know these things can happen quickly. However, there were so many pilots on board. What were there, 15 of them were pilots, yeah, right? They had to have seen this thing outside the window and like, oh, let's go take a look or something. And it gets even yeah. more mysterious when you know that Carol Lombard and Clark Gable visited President Roosevelt in the White House uh, some months uh, after the Cape Girardeau crash, and uh, they went into the U.S. Capitol building. Uh, Gable was a, a Freemason, and so was President Roosevelt. They were able to huddle over these um, secrets if they wanted to. I don't know if they did about Cape Girardeau. And then this terrible event happened where Gable lost his wife, in a UFO-related crash, it, it, the whole thing was just totally spooky. It would make a movie, and people would not believe this if they saw this today, I don't think. But these are facts. Yes, exactly. And I wonder, I mean, if they, when they saw those lights, they must have had some communication, radio communication, with the control towers, yes? I mean, they were probably within range of at least communicating what they were seeing and asking, what is this that we're looking at? Are there other flights in this on this flight plan? Uh, what I've read, there is a, um, a summary of the communication between the radio tower and the plane, and it did not include this. It stopped at some point. Uh, they just left Las Vegas. They're about 33 miles outside of Vegas. Carol Lombard was 33. It was TWA Flight 3 on a Douglas uh, DC-3. And she was wow. in a party of three, and it just goes on and on. It was just so spooky. Huh. Um, uh, Carol Lombard's mother was into numerology, and the whole thing spooked her even before they got on the plane. She flipped a coin and said, no, don't get on this plane. And uh, Carol won the coin flip and decided, yeah, we're getting on this plane. We're going straight home. And so it cost her and her mother and uh, a press agent and these other men on the flight uh, their lives, sadly. Oh. It was, it was an instant death, if there's any consolation. Everyone died, uh, you know, when they hit the side of a sheer uh, cliff and, uh, at 220 miles per hour. It was a gigantic mess. It was, at the time, the worst uh, plane crash in American aviation history. And uh, people in Hollywood especially were devastated. They shut down the studios for like a half hour in a, in a tribute, like nothing's ever been seen before or since. Everyone knew Carol Lombard had loved her, and they offered to give her a gigantic military funeral, and Clark Gable turned that down and wanted to do things very quietly. And then when he died in 1960, he was buried in the crypt right next to her uh, in accordance to his wishes, and that's about where the story uh, kind of comes to an end until those documents got released in the 1980s. Gosh. What an incredible, incredible story. So many synergistic elements that came together to warn her. Mm -hmm. But she was headstrong, and she just decided to go ahead anyways. What a shame. Gosh. Now, <clears throat> going back to uh, to some of your early research and with the, the Cape Girardeau incident, you talk about, and I just, I, I'm not even sure the question to ask you about this, but it's so strange you talk about wrinkly silver, either a covering or a skin. Right. That sounds different than a, a lot of the other gray aliens that have been described. I've never heard this wrinkly thing. What do you think? Could it have been a massive heat shock that went into that craft that also created this? I mean, I've never heard about the, all these wrinkles. <laughs> uh, it, it, yeah, it's strange, and it's... Um possibly involved that the space suits that they could have been wearing were closely connected to the uh, the air filtration system within the craft and when it cracked open for whatever reason uh it could have deeply affected not only the skin but the uh, space suit and uh caused this wrinkly crinkly kind of look to it uh, this is according to what 
uh, Charlotte Huffman's uh, uh, grandmother told her about what uh, Reverend Huffman said that very night, that what he saw, and uh, there were flames all around and people with flashlights and car headlights. So he was able to see things fairly well. It might have been a bit difficult in the moonlight. Uh, it was unusually warm that Cape Girardeau night. So uh, the, the year before around the Easter, it was a snowstorm in Cape. So on the 1941, uh, around Easter time, it was uh, temperatures were up near 80. And could this have caused um, some sort of factor in the, the crinkling of skin uh, along with our oxygen-rich atmosphere that aliens were not familiar with? We could speculate. Uh, I'm not an expert on these uh, sort of matters, but um, I read some sort of document uh, alleging to have been about uh, – uh, gray crash uh, recovery and it talked about how their bodies or their um, flight suits might have been uh, linked in with the air system and waste management of the of their bodies and the craft itself uh, synergistic as you might call it I just am uh, at a loss on quite how to put that so um, I, I can't explain it exactly other than we're talking about alien advanced otherworldly materials either bodies or fabrics and so uh, uh weird things can happen yeah, i guess exactly yeah weird things do happen yes and i have, yeah because i know we've heard from guests also that some of these crafts are really biological crafts They're, the crafts themselves are alive so that may be something tied into what you just mentioned about how it's all connected their life support and everything else and when that goes bad then this is what happens so it, this is an interesting thing because I had never heard that before when other people had described either seeing bodies or alive aliens, gray aliens. I had never heard that particular piece. But certainly they had been through a, a, a pretty vicious crash, and so anything is possible from that point. Now, with the hieroglyphic type of writing, did anybody think to write that down? Did you encounter anybody who had done that? Uh, no, I sure have not. I would sure like to see a recreation, but you hear that in other uh, UFO crash stories, don't you? That uh, there's this oh, yeah. strange hieroglyphic type writing, and what does this mean? The symbols that we've never seen before. I uh, have not seen a reproduction of the Cape Girardeau uh, sim symbols, and so uh, it's just another mystery, unless that farmer comes forward with the uh, the debris <laughs> that he had these strange imprints oh, on. Oh, gosh, he better. Yeah, I would love to see that. Yeah, get, get me a bucket of that crash material, and I'll bring you some strange symbols, I, I promise. <laughs> yes, and I know that people talked about it for uh, vent waters. Larry Warren uh, talked about that. And you mentioned Linda Moulton Howe also uh, having somebody turn this into a binary code, and I believe somebody did that with the vent waters hieroglyphics. And oh. they did get some type of a message. Yes. So I've heard that before. It's very interesting that that's what that is a symbol of. So, gosh, there is just there's so much to all of this. And you've uncovered incredible amounts of facts with the people that you've interviewed. It's amazing. Is there anything? Uh, the, uh, but, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was just saying, of everything that you have investigated, with all of these events, is there anything that, that, I mean, it's all very surprising to some degree, but is there anything that really caught your attention, maybe shocked you more than anything else? Well, that's a good question. And I guess not. Uh, I don't want to um, get too heavily involved in other UFO tales, so I won't muddy the waters of Cape Girardeau. So when people ask me about what about this or Roswell, Oh, what about this other crash? And I'll say, well, I don't really know too much. All I know is of what mostly happened in my town and how this be explained and what happened to the material. But uh, some of the wildest stuff comes out of this, such as the U.S. Capitol building. And how about the Willy Wonka story? Did you <laughs> did you get to that part of the book? No, please tell us that story. Uh, Roald Dahl wrote the book Willy Wonka in later years uh, after forty one. But he came up with a sequel called Willy Wonka and the Great Glass Elevator. It's about the president authorizing a spaceship uh, tour of outer space uh, for Willy Wonka and Charlie Bucket. 
they take off in this metallic uh, vehicle, the great glass elevator, mostly uh, glass and metal, and they uh, encounter aliens in space, and they come back and talk to the president in the White House. Well, I got a copy of this book, and it shows the original artwork, and they show a president seated all the time with glasses, and he looks just like FDR. And it turns out Roald Dahl was stationed in Washington, D.C. in 1941. He was a spy for the British intelligence agency, and his mission was to squeeze every uh, bit of data he could from the Roosevelt family. So, oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes, he sent, he and his boss sent this report to MI5, I believe military intelligence, that for some strange reason, President Roosevelt has a space plan uh, in, in mind. He thinks they're going to somehow send some sort of spaceship to the moon and claim it for American property and stick a flag up there. And this was his idea. And they uh, said, we don't know quite why President Roosevelt thinks they can send a spaceship and have a space program. Well, um, they didn't think too much about it, and Roald Dahl and his boss uh, in the spy business at the time were kind of laughing. Then in 1969, <laughs> what happened? We sent a spaceship to the moon, we planted an American flag, and claimed it as our territory, exactly right. as Roald Dahl said back in 1941. He learned not from, like, Nixon or JFK, but from Franklin Roosevelt, who, of course, as we know now, had possession of an alien spaceship from Cape Girardeau, and they were reverse engineering and trying to turn it into uh, aerial craft of their own to fight in the war. And so the whole thing kind of makes sense now. And so it Willy really Wonka, does. yeah, went on, you know, Roald Dahl went on to write Willy Wonka and then seemingly took aspects of the Cape Girardeau affair and created a sequel of going into outer space and maybe trying to get to the moon and coming back to talk to uh, uh, a president who looks like um, uh, FDR. In fact, his name in the book is the president of Gillegrath instead of Roosevelt. And uh, oh, it's, uh, wow. it's an interesting aspect. And it's like, can this story get any weirder with any more yeah. twists and turns? <laughs> You're I finding know that it. out as you read the books. Yeah. That's right. Again, it's a great, great book. And it is called Three Presidents, Two Accidents. Now, you have a new book you're working on. Now, what is the title of the new book? Uh, the Eisenhower Encounters, that he may have had at least one encounter with humanoid-type aliens at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, the late Art Campbell's an investigator, said Eisenhower also showed up uh, a year later at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico and uh, may have made contact with aliens there. I know it sounds crazy. We are not talking about gray creatures, but human-type aliens that look pretty much like us. They were like cousins to uh, human beings, you might say, and they wanted us to stop our nuclear weapons program, our uh, detonations and testing in the atmosphere. It was threatening uh, to pollute our planet and leak into outer space, and they wanted this stopped. And Eisenhower was not of a mind to uh, take that advice, and he was really rattled by uh, this landing and uh, wanted it all hushed up. So uh, I'm piecing that together, and uh, it's a really exciting, interesting story. And what um, may have happened uh, 10 years later, I won't give you any uh, specific clues on that. When we uh, get together on a future show, we'll go over all the details when that book comes out. Well, I can't wait. I mean, this has been a wonderful evening spent with you, Paul Blake Smith, and hearing all of the incredible details. And again, everybody, if you want to hear the entire story, get the book. It is a great read, Three Presidents, Two Accidents. It is a terrific book written, again, by Paul Blake Smith. Now, this is available on Amazon, too, right, Paul? Right. Mo 41 was the, the first, and the second, Street President's Two Accidents. They should be available on Amazon. I believe still are. Or you can go directly to Argus Books, where they'll send you uh, the books at a reasonable price and pay for the shipping. And that's always huh? a good deal. That is a good deal. Now, what if somebody has resurrected something you might be interested in uh, about Cape Girardeau and the alien craft that crashed in 1941. How do they get a hold of you? I have a special Facebook page where I've been contacted by a number of people with uh, interesting little side stories like my grandmother told me this or my mother swore she talked to Reverend Huffman the day after the crash and said that he 
admitted the the story was true, and uh, uh, there's no. Is that under your name, gun, or but, is that under the book's name? Uh, it, the book it's, uh, under the Facebook page. It's called Cape Girardeau's 1941 UFO Crash: America's First. So you can oh, look right. that up on Facebook. Yeah. And I've got lots of pictures and captions and information. And if you want to send me some uh, information you want it kept anonymously, I will do that too if you don't want your name mentioned. Uh, I don't have any plans now for a sequel on the Cape Girardeau book uh, unless something really explosive happens. So uh, I would be willing to listen if you got more information. But uh, I don't have enough data for a third Okay, well, well, again, Paul, thank you so much. We're going to have to end tonight. We'll be back next mm-hmm. week, everybody, with Eric Raspall, Biodynamic Magic. See you then. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week for another radio adventure with Supernatural Girl. Paul, thank you so much. That was a great interview. Thank you. I I thank you for having me on. As I always ask people, I hope I didn't talk too much. (laughs) You're great. You're a great guest. And you know what I wanted to mention? I don't know if you've got a publisher yet for your new book. Do you have one? It will probably still be with Argus. I deal with them, and uh, they're like a mid-sized publisher. I wish I could get a really big-time book deal, but I'll take whatever I can get. (laughs) Here's, here's what I was thinking. You know, we had um, the guy on the show that wrote the book called The Presidents and UFOs. You familiar with that one? Uh, Larry Holcomb? Was that Larry Yeah, Holcomb? we had Larry on. Yeah. yeah. Now, he he was published, just so you know, with St. Martin's Press. And St. Martin's did a really good movie deal for him with Sony Pictures. Wow. So uh, if maybe I I'll give him a... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I would see about getting your book there, especially since they've had such success with Larry's book that on this is a similar topic. It's obviously not the same, but it's similar. They might have a real interest in this. And if I were you, I'd try to sell it there. Uh, they have printed up a really good book uh, by Larry on presidents and UFOs. It's like a hardback. Uh, I consulted yes. it in my research for the Eisenhower tale. And so it is impressive, and I think I will look into that. Couldn't hurt to try. Well, yeah. I mean, I was thinking about that while we were talking, and I, I would really love to see your book there rather than with Argus. I think that, uh, again, given what Larry shared with me, as I've spoken with him at length about this, uh, they sold the rights to a movie to Sony Pictures. Sony optioned it, basically, was what they did. They optioned it three times. So not only did he get a hefty advance for the book, he got paid for three different options <laughs> that Sony took out on the story. So he just got, kept getting paid over and over and over again. So Do you happen to see which, uh, which presidential story he is going to get uh, turned into a movie? They just, just all his, of them? Yeah, all of them. Oh. So, well, I hope anyways, they don't do the Eisenhower one because that's my turn. I know, I know, but th- here's why I'm thinking, you know, uh, it may be smart of you to reach out to St. Martin's Press, um, either yourself or get an agent who could do that for you and see if they'd be interested. I think your book might be a good match for them. And even if it's not a good match for St. Martin's because they've already had Larry's book out there, I would try with another uh, larger publisher and I would use Larry's book as an example um, that your book is comparable to this and certainly has the potential for just as many sales. So whether you go to Random House or one of their divisions, um, but I would start with St. Martin's and shop it around. Well, earlier uh, when I'm working on these books, uh, Argus gave me a chance and they published them and I'm very grateful, but I would like uh, a bigger book deal, maybe hardback or, you know, more publicity, uh, Argus does a little. They try, but uh, obviously these are all kind of uh, paperback type approaches that uh, uh, many, many people have never heard of Argus. Uh, so.
So I think I will give that a shot, and I thank you for passing that along. Oh, absolutely. And, again, you know, one of the things that I thought was so phenomenal for Larry is the fact that St. Martin's does have those kinds of movie contacts because you and I were discussing how hard it is to get them. But if you're with a a big group like St. Martin's, then they have those contacts, and then it makes sense for you to work with them on a movie deal because then there's a good chance it'll get done. Well, I will uh, formulate some thoughts and get it down at least in an email, if not a printed letter or try anything, smoke signals if I have to. Uh, I've got it down as a note here for me to do. And, again, I thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. Let me know how it goes, all right? And we're definitely going to have you back on the show. So you just let us know when the book's going to drop, and we'll have you back on. I appreciate it. Look forward to it. Okay, Paul. Take good care. Thanks again. You too. Goodbye. Bye-bye.